right. So I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. If uh, thanks on behalf of the ESIP Open Science Cluster. Um, if this is your new uh, first time here, um, please let us know your participant information that both Jenny and Morgan added um, to the chat. Uh, please join our cluster. We'd love to have you. And we are doing this webinar series. And we're super excited to kind of kick off a new focus area of infrastructure um, with our first speaker today, um, Jim Colliander. And I will just introduce you, Jim, and then I'll turn it over to you. And then we'll have a good discussion period afterwards. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. Anything else you want to add, Jenny, before I introduce Jim? No, uh, but thank you from me to uh, Jim. Great. So again, we're very excited to have Jim here. Jim is from 2i2c, and he's going to be talking us about building open source infrastructure for research, education, and local communities. And Jim is one of the co-founders of 2i2c, um, so super excited to have you here, Jim. He's a professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia and previously served as the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences. And while at PIMS and using infrastructure from Compute Canada, he helped create a national scale Jupyter Hub service. He co-founded Callisto, a collaboration between PIMS and Cybera. Callisto develops open education resources and training programs for students and teachers in grade five through 12, leveraging cloud hosted interactive computing, which is super exciting. Um, he also co-founded Crowdmark, an education technology company based in Toronto that provides workflows and AI based improvements to education assessment. And a lot of our, um, a lot of the folks here, Jim, are, have probably used 2i2c or interested in using 2i2c um, technology or infrastructure. So again, we're super excited to have you here. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. So I strongly believe that people working together can do magical things. And I think a through line that runs through many of the highlights that Cynthia nicely highlighted about my career is this idea that maybe there's ways either using technology or social innovation or just being respectful of one another that we can bring people together to do magical things. You know, and I am inspired by um, being a member of the Apollo generation. People went to the moon during my lifetime, and every time I say that, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. But we face incredible challenges because some of the things that we've done together aren't so great for our Earth, and we need to figure out a way to work together to address those things. So the opportunity to speak to this group, uh, sort of the monitors of Earth, and how monitoring the Earth might be able to transform the management of Earth as a sustaining resource for life as we know it, I think is the challenge of our uh, epoch. And this group is at the leading edge of doing that. And it's a great opportunity for me to be able to address you today. Um, so I'm gonna give a talk that is a demonstration in part of some of the infrastructure that 2i2c operates. So the talk is being delivered from a 2i2c hub and if I click this little button, it'll look like slides. And I'm going to follow the process of giving this talk in answer to questions that were posed to me in the invitation that uh, came to lead me to uh, be able to speak to you here today. So I'll ask someone, maybe I can do it, uh, if I highlight this right here and drop it into our Zoom chat, um, that will point to a publicly accessible Jupyter Notebook on GitHub that is the contents of my presentation. Uh, some parts of that talk <clears throat> uh, are suppressed because they're Cody things that don't need uh, to be shown in the context of the slides. But that way, at least you have the content. So I aim to answer four questions. Um, why did my co-founders and I start 2i2c? What are the benefits to open science uh, uh, from working in the cloud? Uh, what are the challenges from an infrastructure standpoint? And what does the future look like? So let's start with this first question. Uh, what were the conditions that led to the creation of 2i2c? 
So there's basically three answers to this question. The first was basically a technology readiness level four, I think took place in the context of uh, interactive computing and cloud computing. Uh, so interactive computing was ready at the moment. Uh, demand for this type of workflow, this type of collaborating on the cloud to interact with data and work together was exploding. And it wasn't just in the traditional disciplines of statistics, data science, and uh, earth sciences. It was in humanities and social sciences and, and beyond. And my colleagues and I that helped found 2i2c have an extremely strongly felt belief that no entity should own the systems for scientific information exchange. And the challenges that we faced as a global community around the internet early days, leading to a change in the way that publications were shared from the printing press era through paper-based books uh, was not good for science. And we wanted to avoid a similar future scenario wherein the ways that we collaborate were owned by any one kind of entity. Those are the three main reasons, and I'll kind of jump into those a little bit and go through some of the history. So while she was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, Jessica Hamrick posted this blog post that I found transformational. In it, she describes how working with others collaboratively, she set up cloud system to enable the delivery of Jupyter through the browser. And I thought this was a, an amazing invention and took inspiration from it when I started serving as the first the deputy director and then the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences. And I asked an extremely talented collaborator there named Ian Allison if we might be able to make this happen for the community of mathematical scientists that we served. And Ian's really talented and we managed to do so. And so this is a picture of Jupyter Hub service across uh, several universities in Canada circa October 2019. Uh, we had 20,000 uh, users. That, I'm sorry, I, I want to make sure that I have the date right. Yeah, that, that was, uh, yeah, 2019. We had 20,000 users across many of these hubs, and the service was called Syzygy. So we demonstrated the capacity using the cloud and a single engineer to deliver Jupyter Hub at large scale. As of today, the Syzygy service is delivering, uh, it has served up to 67,000 users. Um, so that was inspired by this prior work at Berkeley. And we also launched this uh, platform for delivering Jupyter-backed education to students in grades five to 12 in partnership with Cybera. And that's been a really interesting experience to see students engaging with content uh, and learning about things um, using a different model for interacting with ideas. And I was really excited about that project. It continues. Um, and then also in the background was something I'm sure is very familiar to this audience, a remarkable way of working together on uh, cloud adjacent um, computing, putting the compute adjacent to the data to facilitate new ways to carry out big data geoscience. And these ideas were in the mix and it led to the co-founders of 2i2c to recognize that we should build a mission-driven uh, organization with a not-for-profit model strongly aligned with the research service teaching mission of universities to deliver uh, the infrastructure necessary to facilitate this type of collaborative work around data computation, earth monitoring and more. Some questions that were on my mind around that, around that time, should any entity own me email? Imagine that you had to pay FedEx every time you sent an email. I, I don't like that point of view. Um, should you have to pay to use the alphabet? I don't like that at all. And in a similar way, I don't think any entity should own the way that we collaborate as scientists or scholars. And so I wanted to avoid, I wanted to help avoid a scenario wherein one monopoly provider um, owns the way that we work together and the background around scientific publishing and how we as scientists were producing articles, reviewing articles, editing articles, uh, and then having our libraries get hammered by new methods of business delivery of those articles um, was terrible. And I wanted to avoid that type of future state. So that's kind of the background. 
No one should own scientific collaboration. And so 2I2C aims to arrange for the scientific collaboration stack to emerge as a digital public good that no one owns. So there are some background links uh, that go through some of the talks and blogs and presentations that led to the creation of 2I2C. So what is 2I2C? It's the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. It's a fiscally sponsored project of a US 501c3 not-for-profit organization based in Portland, Oregon called Code for Science and Society. And 2I2C designs and delivers um, interactive computing platforms in the cloud for research and education communities. And we do so mostly using open source, entirely using open source software coming from the Jupyter ecosystem generally. Uh, so a quick service description. Um, we provide these hubs interoperably on either Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure for a variety of audiences, students, researchers, uh, sometimes folks in government agencies, sometimes emergency responders. And we stitch it together adjacent to the data, and we provide the appropriate kind of level um, to support to make sure that this infrastructure stands up. And adjacent to these types of services, we also offer some support for publishing processes. Uh, 2I2C nominally right now is uh, providing a lot of the support for the MyBinder service. Uh, and our, uh, our director, Chris Holdgraf, is one of the leaders of the Executable Books Project that has helped to develop Jupyter Book. And that's just a quick overview of kind of the 2I2C hub service. I think 2I2C innovated something really interesting in the open source infrastructure world, which is this concept called the right to replicate. So 2I2C promises to deliver this infrastructure in a manner that is vendor agnostic. So if you have a community that's running on Google Cloud using 2I2C and you decide that for some reason you want to switch over to run instead on Amazon Web Services, then 2I2C promises that the infrastructure is interoperable that way and that the infrastructure is described in a publicly visible way so that if you want to, you can go and run the infrastructure uh, by yourself, your way. Our goal with this is to ensure that the technology and expertise for managing the scientific collaboration stack is dispersed and diffused into the world at large. No one should have expertise. This is an anti-moat strategy, no secret sauce. The secret sauce for 2I2C is that there should be no secrets in the sauce that underpins the way we work together as scientists. Uh, and following that link, if you wish, provides a bit of an overview of hub features, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna explore that more deeply. So next question that was posed to me in the invitation, what are the benefits to open science that arise from working in the cloud? And I think there's kind of three main reasons and I'll go into these in a little bit. The cloud provides new ways to exchange information. The cloud and sensor systems, sometimes on satellites, sometimes on floats in the ocean, essentially provide virtual ubiquity, uh, you know, limited by the speed of light, but we can essentially be everywhere at once. And these two tools together enable a massive expansion in participation in science and scholarship more generally. And in this way, I think the cloud is a new medium through which we can do science differently. And it's creating the technological opportunity to create this future that we're calling openness in science. So let me back up a little bit. What is science? So science is really a social activity. <laughs> science is a social science. It's a systematic social enterprise that builds and organizes our understanding of the universe with testable explanations and predictions. And the activity that we are all engaged in when we do science, whether or not we're teaching our students or speaking with our collaborators or sharing a draft with a collaborator or reviewing someone else's work or editing someone else's work or writing a proposal or reviewing a proposal, the, the core activity of science is the exchange of information so that we develop this human understanding of the universe. So any methods that transform the way information is exchanged have the potential to change the way that we work together to understand the universe. And this focus on exchange of information, I think orients us in the right way to think about openness and to transform 
the, um, the activities that we carry out while doing science. So this is one of the most historically significant diagrams of the last hundred years. This is a diagram that was uh, introduced by Claude Shannon in his paper, Mathematical Theory of Communication. It was in this paper that the term bit as a quantification of information was first introduced. And it's kind of abstracting the idea of information exchange. And thinking about this abstraction of, you know, someone has something to say, it's sent through some sort of a medium, it's received by someone and understood. And if you think about this in the abstract, like a mathematician might, and then try to implement this abstraction, it begins for me at least to explain kind of what the infrastructure is for in order to facilitate science. Um, that paper of Shannon that I just wrote, that I just highlighted was from 75 years ago. And 75 years ago this past June, um, the first invention of the transistor also took place. And shortly thereafter, just about a week later, the second invention of the transistor. So we are in the 75th anniversary of the digital era with the mathematical theory around megabits and gigabits and, quanta and, and communication in general. And then these advances in uh, material science that led to the creation of the transistor. These things facilitated the digital era as we know it. And of course, everyone is familiar with this remarkable exponential pattern of Moore's law. And so the infrastructure, which is really built on all of these advances, is advancing much faster than uh, the human components and the social components. The infrastructure is amazing because of these uh, micro lithography methods, the improvements in transistors. And right now we are at a stage where maybe all of this is going to be juiced even further with the emergence of the qubit and quantum computing. And so we as an organization at ESIP, at NASA TOPS, at UNESCO, I think are trying to innovate how we're gonna organize human structures around this incredible opportunity that's emerging from technology. So the cloud enables new ways for us to exchange information. The cloud enables through distributed sensor systems, virtual ubiquity, and that virtual ubiquity is also in display right now as I speak to people maybe all over the world simultaneously through this Zoom event. So we have new ways to communicate and the cloud enables more participation in science. It's not just the people that are sort of academic royals at the research tier one universities that previously could only participate in science. Now we have ways where everyone can participate in science and that creates new demands in, uh, in the wake of this infrastructure, new demands on social innovation for what we're going to do with this opportunity and how we should set up stuff up. What are the principles that should guide us uh, given all of this opportunity? So there are big opportunities and risks here. Because the cloud enables so much, there are incredible startup opportunities. There's billion dollar uh, startups lurking here. And uh, in some ways, 2I2C aims to be a, uh, a buffer, an obstacle to a billion dollar company. We don't want someone to own science, um, but at the same time, we need to find the right ways to deploy capital and technology and expertise to capitalize on the opportunity that a new, much larger cohort of people could be using the ideas of science to understand the universe as we know it, and hopefully use that understanding to address some of the grand challenges that we face around misinformation, climate change, um, nuclear proliferation, and beyond. We have massive challenges that uh, my generation and the generations before mine have created on behalf of the future generations. And we are at a historical opportunity right now, I think by bringing together technology and social innovation to equip future generations with the tools and ideas and principles to address these grand scale challenges. So what are the challenges from an infrastructure standpoint and what does the future look like? So as I kind of hinted at before, I think the infrastructure is advancing faster than social engineering. And I think the real challenge is to recognize that and to figure out ways to build user interface, codes of conduct, um, collaboration strategies, documentation strategies, onboarding methods that adapt to the massive potential with this huge infrastructure advance. But the goal of science is really to improve human understanding. And so the focus should be more on how to make the humans capable 
and prepared to benefit from the infrastructure. And I think we should be a little bit slower in trying to push the infrastructure to infinity for the people that really know how to do it. We need to bring more people into the infrastructure. So my colleague Yuvi Panda often talks about a concept called accidental complexity. We should not have to know how to use uh, the SSH pipe and Emacs and VI and a bunch of other things if we wanna ask a question about earth science. We wanna eliminate the technology obstacles that are not absolutely necessary to get advances into the essential questions that people are trying to understand. So we wanna put the experts with their questions in touch with the tools that they need to answer their questions and move faster without having to put a bunch of technology hurdles between the expert and their answers. We have a challenge, I think, and it's a very big and hard challenge to prevent monopoly in this space and instead build up digital public goods. I would like a future of science that looks more like Wikipedia and less like Facebook, but the opportunities here are significant. And I think a lot of decision makers that are looking at infrastructure have a kind of continuum between them but, uh, that they face. On one end, they think, ah, oh, you know, it's open source. I'll just build it myself. I just have to find the engineers. If I can find the engineers, you know, we can go to GitHub. We can find this stuff. We can launch our own cloud computing and we can build the thing ourselves. And then on the other end, there are things like GitHub Code Spaces or Google Colab. Maybe we should just buy it from them. And 2i2c aims to kind of be in between where some of the just turn it on and it works best experience parts of things that the monopoly provides are blended with some of that customizability and homespun potential of build it your own. But if we don't find a way to kind of take care of the build desire with the appropriate scalable, robust engineering practices that comes from the other side, then I think we're going to slide towards monopoly. And so we need ways to protect science against the emergence of monopoly and create digital public goods that provide scientific collaboration. And that's kind of, I think, part of the mission of 2i2c, but we need a lot more partners in doing this because one small not-for-profit is not going to win in this kind of a battle against the monopolistic forces. Right now, I think also in infrastructure, we are struggling with skeuomorphism. So here is a telephone, but you'll notice that because people who used the telephone prior to the invention of push buttons did so with a rotary thing. And so you see here how the buttons are set up to mimic the rotary phone. I think right now we have a similar sort of skeuomorphism that is taking place in uh, our transition. So we talk about papers on the internet because we haven't quite figured out what the new form of an academic uh, dynamic science object with data and tools looks like. So I think we're in a bit of a transition from the past where data was siloed and then 2012 was the era of open data. And now I think the future is uh, one involving discoverable data with the companion tools. So anyone can find the data easily. And we also know what tools are necessary to get insights, visualizations, and uh, advanced human understanding. Um, in the past, we had paper uh, locked in journals, in libraries that were only accessible if you happen to have an identification card that allowed you to go into that library. And then it began to be a little bit more accessible with so-called papers on the internet. But papers are often kind of an advertisement for the science that's really going inside of the creation of that story. So are there ways that we can make the science more accessible, more visible, more dynamic, and allow others to participate in the discovery and kind of see how a scientist or a group of scientists work together with questions and data and tools and laboratory equipment and other things. So we have a way to mobilize the knowledge of science that goes beyond the traditional scholarly publication. We also have a past where uh, participation in science often required affiliation at an elite university. And we've seen in recent times a transition through massive open online courses and other ways with Zoom, for example, where people begin to be able to participate somewhat in science more so. But I think the future involves uh, something that is much more um, duty bound. I think we need to 
start thinking about a human right to participate in science in the same way that it's necessary for successful democracies to have citizens be able to read. And therefore, it's incumbent upon governments to ensure that we have systems in place to develop literacy. The future is going to involve an expanded notion of literacy. And we see the challenges right now around misinformation. We need critical thinking, the uh, understanding of data and the tools necessary to get insights for data around data. And this human right to participate in science, I think is going to emerge as a requirement for effective democracies. Um, but right now we are far behind that. Instead, we are you know, involved in persuasive tech and manipulation. Uh, a lot of things that these monopoly providers are doing, um, they may change our consumer behavior, but we need to be able to change our decision behavior and the way that we work together in society around data. So maybe I'll just wind down with uh, some other observations about this transition from past to the future. So for me, there are two remarkable heroes of my training, my experience, my development as a scientist that I think are just incredible human beings, but the ways that we celebrate them, the sort of hagiography around these heroes is very individual principal investigator rather than team. They invented things that were transformational around many other people and so forth. But you know, here's a hero of mine from the past, Claude Shannon, the inventor of information theory, the progenitor in many ways of artificial intelligence. Um, so you know, he developed the mathematical theory that allowed for telecommunication and eventually the internet. Um, he quantified the bit. I, uh, I think he's a hero. But the way that he is celebrated is very personal focused rather than team focused. Another hero of mine is Richard Feynman, who I think is an amazing teacher. He made available all of these incredible uh, books that allow one to learn physics. But there is also, you know, considerable sexism in the way that he operated. And the exceptionalism that we associate with Feynman often, I, I think, makes, it fe makes me feel sometimes like I could never be like him, or maybe I can kind of be like him. But being like Feynman is aspirational. But being an effective scientist is not necessarily having all of the characteristics of Feynman. And we're in the midst of a transition. So there are emerging heroes, at least for me, that are changing the way that I view science and think about what it means to be a contributor to the human understanding of the universe. And so one of my new heroes is Jane Goodall, who worked uh, to understand chimpanzees in the Gombe, but then through that work, expanded her participation in what we might call science or an understanding of the universe by creating lots of activism and defending the earth, defending the regions around the Gombe and then beyond. And through this work, she has created, you know, a global network of young people that are thinking about the earth in a much more sensitive, sustainable and transformational way. Another hero of mine, I'm sorry, this is cut off in the way that my slides are set. Uh, maybe I can shrink it a little bit. Uh, as OSTP director Arati Prabhakar. Uh, so she has brought together all of the federal agencies um, around this open science initiative. And I think she is setting the stage in a manner kind of similar to what Vannevar Bush did in the post-World War II era to really transform the way that we think about science. And another hero of mine is Shel Genteman, who's leading NASA TOPS. She is also bringing together people in remarkable new ways to think about a new imagined era of science. And maybe less, I'll end on who are the heroes of the future? So I would like to imagine that some of the people in my audience are heroes of the future that are going to find ways to use science to improve the world, to manage the world, to understand the human relationship towards a sustainable earth. And if I could sort of abstract what a hero scientist of the future looks like, for me, it's kind of like the Lorax. The Lorax counted the trees. And in that way, was kind of a data scientist and spoke for the trees about the value of the trees. But I'd like us all to sort of think about our relationship to our scholarship and the impact of our scholarship in improving the human understanding of the universe. And that means that our students, our children, our grandparents all understand the world a better way because of the ways that we contribute to it. And that sensitive understanding of our little part of the understanding of the universe, our sharing of that, I think is the way that we as a civilization can transform and improve and protect our earth. Infrastructure is part of this. It's the way through which these communications take place. 
but it's really about values and the way that we move those values into our relationships that I think is the transformation. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Jim. Uh, fascinating presentation. Um, certainly a, a, a lot, a lot to, to consider and I wanted to open it up for questions. Um, please feel free to take yourself off mic and uh, answer, ask a question or pop your question in the, the meeting chat and I will relay it to Jim. Well, I will kick it off, Jim. I was wondering if you, if you feel that your thinking has um, kind of changed or evolved with regard to infrastructure in the in the last maybe two to three years, um, with regard to kind of monopoly providers, misinformation, etc. Absolutely. So uh, I'll tell you a story. So when uh, the when 2i2c was just an idea, uh, my colleague UV Panda, uh, I think it's fair to say, insisted that the only way he would participate in this organization was if we supported the right to replicate. And my early approach to 2i2c was much more informed from a for profit venture backed startup perspective. And I was worried, we don't have a competitive advantage. We need a moat. We need a way to defend our tech in order to build something that is sustainable. And UV said, well, I don't want to do it then. And so I embraced this idea of the right to replicate with considerable caution. And then I brought the story of 2i2c to folks in universities that were thinking about using Jupiter for education and to principal investigators and grant holders who were thinking about using Jupiter Hub for their research. And I explained, we are delivering this service with this right to replicate. And the reaction from those folks was striking. The reaction was, oh, you're different. You're not just trying to harvest money. You're offering a business continuity plan that is different from escrowed code. You're just making the code public and you're promising to make the code interoperable. You're creating conditions for us to use the cloud interoperably across the three main vendors. And so the reaction was that the relationships that I was trying to forge with these folks uh, was kind of on my initial interaction was vendor customer, but because of the right to replicate, the relationship transformed into nonprofit partner and nonprofit university or nonprofit partner in 2I2C and nonprofit, uh, you know, NSF funded principal investigator. And so this right to replicate massively changed the conversation with folks that were potentially going to provide revenue back to 2I2C. And then after I saw that reaction, it massively influenced my own thinking about this. Um, and that partly is why I went into thinking about the history of the Bell system and so forth. So right after the transistor was invented, in part so that AT&T could maintain their monopoly, AT&T open sourced for the first time, really. The patent was made available. And throughout the management of the communication system that was built by AT&T and its partners, there was a constant modulation between monopolist, protected monopoly, and release of some of the technology to facilitate the management of the monopoly. And part of the argument there goes back to the early 1900s by the CEO of the Bell System, at that time was Theodore Vail. And Vail argued that the right to telecommunication was paramount. It, we had to be able to communicate. You had to be able to call your sister if she was in trouble. And in order to facilitate the right to participate, Vail argued with governments that we needed a massive investment in technology to make that possible. And the only way we'd get that technology built 
is if we had enough investment coming through a monopoly. And that worked for the Bell system for, you know, 80 some years. Um, so my transformed thinking about infrastructure is that we have to place it on principles like the right to communicate or the right to participate in science. And then we have to figure out the right business structures and the right principles that enable these fundamental rights like participating in science. So infrastructure as a means of achieving human transformation uh, was inspired by my experience with this right to replicate. You might be asking the question for a more technological point of view, and I can also provide comments there, but um, I think that's for me the, 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 high, the, the high takeaway. Thanks, Jim. And um, let me see. So a question in the chat. Is 2I2C being actively used by individual research projects now? Uh, how do they publish their work and is there a catalog? Yes. So let me, uh, I'm going to find a link real quick, Cryo, CryoCloud. So here's, I think, a showcase example of a community that 2I2C is serving. Uh, so the CryoCloud community um, is funded in part from NASA Talks and from funding from the ISAT2 team at NASA. This group of people seeks to understand the ice on Earth, the Earth's cryosphere. So they are using a 2I2C Jupiter hub uh, with the compute adjacent to NASA's ISAT2 data on Amazon Web Services. They are publishing Jupyter notebooks uh, freely accessible on GitHub and also making those visible through their uh, CryoCloud. Maybe I can do it a slightly different way. Um, so this would give you access to their hub. So if I click there and I had credentials, I could log into their hub. Uh, but this over here is providing information about the community, but then also developing tutorials and reports on, for example, uh, here is a Jupyter notebook rendered in this documentation site. The goals of this particular tutorial are to understand how to access ISAT2 and Landsat data. And then it goes through an entire process of explaining how to study this, uh, uh, this aspect of the Earth system in a very um, technically rich, precise, code-based way. And you can download this notebook. And if you have access to an appropriate Jupyter Hub, run it yourself and use an API to pull in the data and do the work themselves. Um, 2I2C also supports sharing of some of these data-rich uh, objects through the MyBinder service. Um, 2I2C is not MyBinder, but we help uh, operate MyBinder. And so Binder is a way to um, assemble an uh, ephemeral Jupyter Hub that is delivering content that is freely accessible on GitHub. And then you can kind of read a paper, but while reading the paper, you're doing so in a much more dynamic rather than just eyes on it kind of way, because you can change the code or change the uh, data that you're interested in looking at, uh, maybe adjust the visualization. So 2I2C is actively being used by many research projects. Another example is we are supporting the Alabama Water Institute's um, co collaborative, collaborative Institute for Research to Operations in Hydrology, which is called Cairo. So Cairo is a multi-stakeholder community consisting of traditional academics, you know, hydrologists, but also people that are interested in hydroelectric power or the use of hydroelectric resources for agriculture. So how do we understand and manage North America's hydrological resources? So that is a multi-stakeholder question. And 2I2C is supporting that community with a Jupyter Hub. And the community with their expertise is finding ways to integrate the data and storytelling and training to bring it all together. So there's a few examples um, in answer to Elizabeth's question. Thank you, Jim. Other questions?
Okay, well, I have a, a slightly different uh, question. How does um, language feed into the thinking of 2i, 2c, and particularly the, the, the question of accessibility for kind of non-native um, English speakers, for example? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, with funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, 2i2c launched a project with a collection of partners. And uh, one of my colleagues, I think, is online named James Monroe, who is helping to guide this project. So with help from Meta Docencia, the Carpentries, and some other partners, we are seeking to improve data science capacity in Latin America and Africa. And there are significant challenges in translating documentation presently written in English or not yet written in any language into Spanish or into Portuguese or into other languages. So I think the open source ecosystem is very sensitive to these issues and is creating the technology that facilitates that transition. But the consequences of colonialism and the consequences of US leadership in large part in science over the past hundred years means that English often in a foreign accent is the standard way that most science is presently communicated. I mean, it sort of supplanted the middle ages era of Latin, if you will. Um, but that's an obstacle for some. And the future state that we need to build towards is interoperability technologically and interoperability in terms of linguistics. Um, so uh, I would describe the answer to your question as a work in progress, but that work in progress has to be anchored on a principle. And the principle is that every human being should be able to participate in science and not just those that speak English, but the reality is the technology and the historical legacy makes it difficult to achieve that target but a principle guides the infrastructure choices thereafter. I see James shared a link. Thank you, James. James, do you have any other comments on the answer to that question? Maybe you want to jump in. I'm not sure if I hit the mark. I, I, I think you did there, there, there Jim. I, James, we are also from 2i2c. Uh, in terms of, of multi-language, um, this particular Catalyst project will produce materials in Spanish because of our partnerships with an organization called Meta Decencia. Uh, we're also looking at how to make that accessible to a number of different languages which are more popular in, in, in Africa. Jupiter as an ecosystem supports an international um, internationalization as, as a feature. So that's something that 2i2c that has innovated, but the Jupiter project as a whole uh, so supports uh, multiple languages for the user interface. Um, uh, but but it's it, it's acknowledged that that's important and it's something that we are or we are trying in some small part to contribute to to make the resource not monolingual um, but reach people where they actually are and how they're able to best do science. Thanks thanks very much. Any other questions? We sh the surely must be another question from the audience. There was so much information that Jim provided. Okay. Well, I uh, very much appreciate um, the presentation today, Jim. So much, uh, so much information and, um, you know, so, so, it seems so innovative uh, in so many regards. Um, and with that, uh, I think, have I missed any final comments, Cindy? I don't think so. And I'll also ditto what you said, um, Jim. It's always great to hear you present. And I love your incorporation of the human aspect into everything that you do. And so I appreciate you being being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm serious. We need ESIP to be successful. Uh, we're in a really difficult situation. You know, colleagues in British Columbia near where I live right now are having their homes on fire. So, you know, we're, we're all the Lorax. 
And I hope that the ESIT community helps bring us together to figure out a way to uh, be sustained as humans on earth in a pain-free way. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. I'm inspired by your work.